Hello, welcome back to probability modeling. Today we're going to start doing, as you can see on the slide, chapter six, focusing on Poisson processes. As you may see, the slides look a bit different. I've done a little bit of cleaning up so that uh, there's less space taken by the outline at the top. So you, things will be more easy to see sometimes. All right, so let's dive in Poisson processes. These are the last the last kind of object we'll introduce, and I hope you'll see that they are really an interesting and beautiful mathematical object. So, what are we talking about? So, Poisson processes, in the, let's say, the most generic one-dimensional case, is a way of modeling random times at which interesting events happen. So, say you have an event which can be any of those events, so eruptions of a volcano, they will happen you know, at certain dates on the calendar, and the Poisson, processes can, the Poisson process can model that by saying eruptions happen at this time, that time, and also that time. So kind of things which we like modeling by Poisson processes, customers arriving in a queue that's very popular, incoming calls to a phone if you're some kind of uh, you know, if you work in the phone call department or a phone operator or something, you can say they arrive as a Poisson process, eruptions of a volcano, and so on. It's really um, a way of modeling things. You know, things happen at random times. A good one also, which uh, you can see sometimes, is uh, buses. If, if there's a lot of uh, weird traffic, and buses stop being properly on time, then you can say they arrive along the Poisson process. And there's also higher dimensional uh, Poisson processes. So you can't, you don't necessarily model things arriving in your one dimension of time, but maybe they arrive, well, they're placed at a space, which can be two or three dimensional or N dimensional if you're doing weird abstract things but we're not going to talk about those for a while. So yeah, Poisson process models things happening at certain times and it's very yeah uniformly random in a way you could say, but uniform distribution is not very important here because actually what we're going to look at, the important thing is the Poisson distribution as the name of the, pro the process suggests. So first, a little bit of recaps about the Poisson distribution, which I'm sure you've seen probably last year. So the definition, so I guess we use this notation PO of lambda is the distribution of a random variable such that the probability of being X, where X is a non-negative integer, is equal to lambda to the X e to the minus lambda divided by factorial of X. So, of course, you'll notice that these sum up to 1 because if we ignore the thing on the right, then we get the series for e to the lambda, and this would cancel out with e to the minus lambda. And very important thing to know is that the expectation and the variance of a Poisson variable are both equal to lambda. That is definitely convenient. Things which you need to know about Poisson distributions, for example, is that the family of Poisson distributions, this is not necessarily very clear, but the whole family is additive in the sense that if you add two independent Poisson random variables, say their parameters are lambda and mu, then you end up with, again, a Poisson distribution. X plus Y is Poisson with parameter lambda plus mu. So you know it has to be lambda plus mu because the expectations will add up and the variances will also add up. So of course that needs, if it's Poisson, it's need, it needs to be that. To show that it's Poisson is a proper math thing to do, but you can check one of the previous exercises in the sheet. And it's easy, it's easy enough to do if you look at the generating function. So if you remember generating function where we defined it, in particular, 
when uh, two variables are independent, then the generating function of the sum is just the product of the generating functions, and then things end up combining exactly the way we want. So check this exercise if you're, if you're interested, which you should be. Another interesting thing about Poisson distributions is that they arise quite naturally as a limit of binomial distributions. So this needs to be explained reasonably precisely. So if you imagine a binomial distribution where you take n, n tries and the probability of any try being a success is mu divided by n. So on average, you will have mu successes, but they get more and more spread out as you do more tries, but the tries are less and less likely to succeed. So, you know, for example, you have a n-sided die and you throw it n times and you count the number of times you land on one. That's exactly that with mu equals one. So yeah, to be specific, the probability of success is proportional, inversely proportional to the number of tries. And it turns out that in the limit, you get a Poisson distribution with parameter mu. This is, this is a good thing to know. It's something you have learned last year. It seems that there's a proof in the MAS113 course. And if you don't remember this, I invite you to try and do that by yourself. It's not very hard. In fact, let me, I'll write a tiny bit. So I've improved my technology. You would write, you know, probability, wrong pen, probability that, so to take your binomial, ooh, uh, let me fix the lighting. Let me fix. I have a shadow of the webcam, but I think there'll be less glaring going on. Probability that a binomial, so we said n mu over n, that's a mu, is equal to k. Well, remember how binomials work. You would get k choose n times mu over n to the power k times 1 minus mu over n to the power n minus k. And I'm going to stop here. The rest is for you to do if you want to. But you see, you're going to get an e to the minus mu from this thing. Put the bracket here. Then the n to the k will cancel out with this. You will get the factorial k from that and so on. Yeah, so it th things will cancel out. And as I said, that's all I'm going to say on that. You can check your old course for more details. Let's go back to the slides. All right, so good thing to know about Poisson distributions is that there's their limit to binomials. And that's all I wanted to say about the Poisson distribution. So now we can actually tackle the main thing. What is the Poisson process? So as we said, it models things happening on the time scale. So we take continuous time scale, which is it's always going to be the positive real numbers. And time variable is often t, quite natural. And here's a, a convenient convention. We're going to use intervals always like that. So an interval uv is open on the left side and closed on the right side. 
And so later on in the future, when we say an event happens between U and V, it means it happens maybe at V, but not at U. And doing that in particular makes it, you know, you can say that the, the interval 0 to 2 is the union of the interval 0 to 1 and 1 to 2, and things are not ambiguous in the slightest. Okay, so the Poisson process, it's given by a family of random variables n u v with u smaller than v. And n u v is the number of occurrences of volcano eruptions or phone calls happening in your time interval u v. So happening between u and v. And what we're going to say, of course, is what their distribution is and how they interact. So there's one parameter for the Poisson process, which is a number lambda, lambda, which we call the rate of the Poisson process. And why is it called the rate? Well, it's one way of saying that lambda is the average, the expected number of events, of occurrences of your event happening in one unit of time. And we'll see, we'll see more about what this means a bit later. And here's exactly how you characterize your Poisson process. So the distribution of n u v, the number of occurrences between u and v, is a Poisson variable with parameter lambda times v minus u. So v minus u is the length of your interval, u v, and then we multiply that by lambda. So that's a. Remember, we call this property A. And then there's property B, which are if we take, let's say, U1, V1, U2, V2, all the way to UK, VK, so K different intervals, we make them disjoint. So U2 is at least as big as V1. Let's say if they're in order, U2 would be at least as big as V1, U3 would be at least as big as V2, and so on. They don't need to be in order. This could be the smallest. In any case, I want them to be disjoint. And when they're disjoint, all these variables, so the number of occurrences happening inside these intervals, they are all independent. So the number of volcano eruptions happening between times 1 and 10 is independent from the number of occurrences happening between times 11 and 15. And together, they're also independent of whatever is happening between 21 and 22. Okay, and this lets you characterize the whole thing because you get, you can find the distribution of basically everything. You know, these are independent and Poisson, and then if we had intervals which were mixed together, then you could combine things, and you'll see this in some exercises, I think. Just separate things properly. So, assumption A, which was that NUV is Poisson with uh, parameter lambda times V minus U. This means that its expectation is equal to its parameter. So the mean is lambda times V minus U. So in, a, in V minus U units of time, we'll have on average lambda times V minus U occurrences. And so this means that you know, this fits our definition and interpretation of lambda as a rate, as we said two slides before. Okay, so a good question one can ask oneself is that, does this actually work? Like, is it possible to build all these random variables, which are all Poisson and independent when the intervals are separate? So the main the main takeaway of uh, this independence property B is that if I take U, V, and W like that, then N, U, W is the sum of N, U, V, and N, V, W, because as we said, that's the number of occurrences. So these two should be independent, and they add to this one. And this works because of the additive property of Poisson variables. So this one 
we know that if this is Poisson lambda v minus u and this is Poisson lambda w minus v, when you add them together, you get the Poisson and the parameter is the sum of both of these parameters. So you get lambda times v minus u and lambda times w minus v. I should write this down and then we'll get lambda times w minus v. I'll write this down, it's worth noting. So n, n u v is Poisson times lambda v minus u. That's a u, that's a v. And then n v w, that's a Poisson lambda w minus v. So, well, so, n u v plus n v w we get Poisson of lambda times the sum of these things well lambda v minus u plus lambda w minus v and that's the same thing as Poisson lambda w minus u so what I'm saying is that you know it seems that in our definition we could get two two ways of finding the distribution of n u w one by saying well by a it needs to be poisson lambda w minus u but by a for the two smaller ones and then b and adding them and using additivity of poisson we get that but they're the same so things are fine and you know you couldn't just define Poisson process well define a similar process with similar rules if we didn't have the addi the additivity property and yeah so so it needs to be Poisson but there's other reasons for it to be Poisson and uh, so there's an interesting heuristic we th can think of why why are we taking n u v to be Poisson with parameter lambda v minus u. Well, here's one thing. Divide your interval 0 t into n small intervals. Uh, I'll write this actually. So take your 0 t interval and then divide it into n, n smaller intervals. So this is like t over n, 2t over n, and there would be more of course, but this is n minus one, t over n, and so on. So these all have length t over n. And we're gonna do something which is may, maybe a bit surprising, but we'll see that it's fine. Assume that, so we know, assume that these things are all independent, but let's not assume that they're Poisson. So we're going to find out that the big one will be Poisson anyway. We assume so that in particular, the probability that there's two events happening in one of these things will be negligible. I'm not going to say exactly what negligible is, but we want the expectation of the number of uh, occurrences in any interval to be lambda t over n and that it's only 0 or 1 we're gonna ignore when it can be actually more than 1 okay then the number of total occurrences on my interval will be if we ignore the fact that there might be two things in the same interval it's going to be binomial n lambda t over n and remember what we said just before that this thing converges to a Poisson distribution and so basically we're using this as another heuristic to show that n zero t needs to be Poisson and since everything is quite symmetric everything needs to be Poisson so assuming that these are independent, these have the expectation we want, 
and these are bigger than two a negligible amount of times then we get that everything has to be Poisson so this suggests the Poisson distribution as a sensible model in the real continuous time setting which it is but still as I said you can think about is it, are there other ways of uh, getting these assumptions A and B without using the Poisson distribution? The answer is yes. So let's go back. So in particular, you know that the Gaussian distribution has an ad additivity property as well, right? If you add two independent Gaussians, then you add their means and their variances, kind of like, kind of like the Poisson case really, except that there's two parameters. Let's say the mean is zero. If you add two independent Gaussians, you get a Gaussian and its variance is the sum of the variances. And in fact, you could define a process which satisfies this A and B, but we get Gaussian instead of Poisson. It works, except that you know that the big difference is that Poisson is just a non-negative integer, while Gaussians can be any real number and when you use the Gaussian distribution the post instead of the Poisson distribution you get a thing called Brownian motion which you will see in the future if you continuing if you continue doing probability which is also a fascinating object but for now let's stop at the Poisson process yeah so we're done with that and here's a little bit of a simulation so what does this simulation show you? So we have our time scale at the bottom from zero to 10. And then on the Y axis, we have the number of events seen. So what is that? So at the beginning, let me put back the slide in big. At the beginning, there are no events. So we wait a little bit of time. And then here's my first event. So we count it. So we're counting the number of events. So now there has been one event. We wait a little bit of extra time. And here's the second event. So now this is two. Wait a little bit. Three. Wait a tiny bit. Four. Wait a little bit. Five. And then there's a long wait for some reason. It's all random, of course. And then six, seven, eight. So, so, so this figure this figure it really it plots so we it plots n of 0 t this is what's plot in the in the figure n of 0 t so the number of events which have happened before time t and if you think about it n of 0 t gives you everything and you'll see quite often we refer to the Poisson process as just the function n of zero t and we're not using it in the slides but it's pretty convenient to just call that nt and nt n of t contains all the information about the Poisson process So, you know, despite we said that NUV is a function with two variables, we really only need a function with one variable. And that's because NUV is N of V minus N of U. Of course, the events happening between U and V, so I can see that it's hard to dis distinguish my U and my V. V. but the events would happen between u and v well you take all the events before v and take away those which were before u basically and so yeah, if you do more Poisson processes in the future they might be they might just use this notation because that's that's really enough information And so this function n of t, it's, no, it's increasing an integer value and it jumps whenever there's an event or an occurrence 
of the phone call or a volcano eruption and so on. Okay, talking about volcano eruptions, let's go through an example. Let's go through an example which we're going to call example 33 and that'll just show us how to play around with Poisson distributions. Example 33, eruptions. So I am telling you that there is a volcano somewhere you like. And this volcano erupts on average on average once per century. So it's a very well behaved volcano which for some reason has decided to use our convention of uh, counting time. And let's assume that eruptions follow a Poisson process. And the question is, the question is, we're going to find probabilities of things happening. Find the probability of, so two things. Well, probability that, sorry, probability that. Question A is, there are exactly two eruptions in the next 80 years. And question B is that the next eruption is at least t years away. Okay, t is just a real number, some arbitrary number. At least t years away. So how do we solve this? Well, first we said it's a Poisson process, so we need to find out its parameter lambda. But it's given to us here because we know that it erupts once per century on average. So lambda, if we count time in years, so we, the, the time scale is years, if we count time in years, which you don't have to, but here it seems quite natural because we're seeing the question has 80 years and t years. Lambda equals 100 because on one year we'll see on average a hundredth of an eruption and we need a hundred years to actually see an eruption. And so question A. Question A was in the next 80 years there are two eruptions. So the number of eruptions in the 80 year period eighty year period that's going to be Poisson distributed and the distribution well the parameter uh, PO of so 80 years, 80 lambda, so 80 divided by 100. So that's also the same thing as Poisson of, let's just say, 0 0.8. And so we want the probability that this Poisson is equal to 2. So our answer 
is going to be so remember e to the minus lambda times you get lambda squared divided by factorial of 2 and plug this in your calculator if you want and you get 0 0.1438 so pretty low which is what we'd expect on average it takes 100 years to get an eruption so getting two eruptions in less than 100 years should be rather low and yet yeah, it's 15 percent about so what about question b so probability that the next eruption is t years away it's the same thing as saying that there are no eruptions in the following t years same thing as no eruptions in unit of time zero t so we said the intervals are open on the left side even the first one zero doesn't really count and so we want the probability we want a p poisson with parameter that's t divided by 100 to be equal to zero and the probability of that is just exponential of minus the parameter so we get the result is exponential of minus t divided by 100 and that's the answer so remember uh, probability of a Poisson variable being zero it's e to the minus lambda times lambda to the power zero that's one so here there's really a lambda to the zero if you like and you divide it by factorial of zero these are both one so we just left with that okay so this is how you use your Poisson process more explicitly to say some things about probabilities of event happening. All right, so that was a basic introduction to what is this process, how does it count things, and what is the distribution. Now, we're gonna start the next section. We're not gonna finish that today, I think, but there are some things we can say already. So, multiple occurrences and inter-occurrence times. So we're going to call things called the inter-occurrence times and it's kind of like renewal processes. T1 is the length of time before the first occurrence. T2 is the length of time after the first and before the second occurrence. And Tn in general is the time between the n minus one occurrence and the nth occurrence. These are called the inter-occurrence times. And the first thing we need to check is that they can't be zero which we're going to do in a minute but first let's go back to our picture and just realize what these are so t1 is i think you can see my mouse i hope you can see my mouse let me check actually because i've been doing that for a while yes i'm quite confident that you can see my mouse so T1 is, is this unit of length. It's the unit of length, well, it's the amount of length until we jump to one. T2 is that amount of length. So T2 is about a little bit larger than one, I think. Then you get T3 is that thing, it's pretty small. T4 is tiny, T5 is less tiny, and T6 is big, and so on. So as we said, the first thing which we need to show is that none of those tn's are equal to zero so in other words we don't jump by two units it's impossible to jump by two units you can't have the volcano erupt twice simultaneously 
exactly simultaneously. Um, this makes sense if you think that these events shouldn't be that common, but it needs proof. And I think we have enough time to do that. So here's our theorem. Probability that, let's say in the interval zero to t, there are two occurrences at exactly the same time is zero. So as you know, an event with probability zero basically will not happen. So theorem, we call that theorem 18. Theorem 18. So uh, the probability, let me write it down. The probability that in zero T two occurrences happen at the same time is zero. And let us go ahead and prove this. So we're going to do something we've done not long ago. Divide it, divide your interval in n intervals and sub intervals, if you like, with length t over n. So I'll draw it again. That is actually a straight line, zero t, and so we divide it here. We get t over n, here we get two t over n. 3t over n dot 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 and at some point we get n minus 1 t over n so you get n different intervals they all have length t over n why do we do this well if you get two occurrences at the same place in particular you will get two occurrences in the same interval at some point, there will be one interval which has two occurrences. And that we can say, we can compute the probability of that happening and figure out that it's very small, so things should not happen. So consider first only one, one small interval. The probability of having at least two occurrences there, of at least two occurrences inside that one small interval is, so probability that the Poisson variable is bigger than two. That's the same thing as one minus the probability of being zero or one. I'm going to write it like that. One minus e to the minus lambda t over n. So remember, lambda times length minus lambda t over n e to the minus lambda t over n. So parameter times e to the minus parameter divided by factorial of one. Okay, and we're gonna factorize by this thing and we get one minus e to the minus lambda t over n times one plus lambda t over n. Good. 
So now we know the probability that you have two occurrences inside the small interval. So the probability of having, now let's you know, regroup our small intervals together and let's say call yn the number of small intervals with two occurrences. Two or more, sorry, two or more, at least two. Then, you know, we're just recording for each small interval if there's at least two occurrences, and then we're going to add them together. So this is really a binomial. Since by property B, each interval will have an independent number of occurrences, this means that yn is a sum of independent variables which are 0 or 1, so that makes it a binomial. yn is binomial, and we have n tries, and the probability of success, so here success is having two or more occurrences, so it's that thing I wrote, I wrote just before, 1 minus exponential minus lambda t over n times 1 plus lambda t over n. And, you know, guessing the answer, we think that yn should be mostly 0. And so let's compute that probability. Probability that yn equals zero. Now that is equal to, well, remember, remember your binomial distribution. So probability of having zero successes is the same thing as n failures. So we're going to take one minus that. So one minus one minus. So we're left with just this and then put this to the power n. E to the minus lambda t over n times 1 plus lambda t over n to the power n, and power n goes over everything. And if you remember your basic analysis, this thing to the power n will tend to exponential of lambda t. And here the n cancels out with this n, so we get exponential minus lambda t. So this tends to 1 as n tends to infinity. And that's pretty good. We're saying the probability of occurrences happening in disjoint small intervals, never having two in the same, the probability of that tends to 1. And that's basically what we want. You just need to realize it and rephrase things properly. So if there were two simultaneous occurrences simultaneous occurrences with probability p which is positive then we would have, you know, if, if there's two occurrences at the same place, in particular, they're in the same sub-interval, then we would have P of Yn equals zero. Well, that would be at most one minus P, of course, for all N. which would contradict this, would contradict the above limit. So since it would contradict something we just proved, 
This means that this assumption would be wrong. So we don't have two simultaneous, simultaneous occurrences with a positive probability. So the probability is zero. And so we've proved our theorem. Excellent. So that's that. And we are almost done for today. Let me just kind of give a preview of the next thing we'll do tomorrow. So here's a very nice theorem. The inter-occurrence times are independent of each other and they're exponentially distributed with parameter lambda. So if we go back to this picture, which I've shown you a lot already, I'm saying that all these times, this time, that time, this time, that time, this guy, and also this time, and so on, they were actually chosen independently with an exponential distribution. And that, so that's a really, really strong property. So we're saying that for a Poisson process, really the way you can describe it is say, wait for an exponential amount of time, add one, you know, add one, record an event, wait for an exponential amount of time, record an event, and so on and so forth. And at this point, you may realize that this is, this is actually very similar to renewal processes. Because we're saying, wait for an amount of time, then record something, record a renewal, record an event, increase one to your N of T, then wait for a unit of time with the same distribution, and again, record, and so on. And in fact, yes, this, this link makes sense because you could say that the Poisson process is a renewal process, but with uh, continuous waiting times. So the renewal processes we've done, the waiting times were integers, uh, strictly positive integers. Here, your waiting time is an exponential variable. So it's a generalization of the renewal processes that you know already. And all right, so that's it for today. That's actually quite a lot. So uh, take your time to take in these things. We will start next time by proving uh, this theorem here. And let me just say for those who want to do some exercises, you can work, you can work on a few of the exercises. I guess I will show the exercise sheet you can work on the first one this oops, sorry 48 is fine 49 should be fine as well and 50 seems fine uh, maybe yeah maybe you can do 48 49 50 the 51 you will need to be more familiar with the waiting times so Let's stop here. Okay, I will see you on Friday. Friday at eleven. The it's already on the on the playlist, so you will see. I won't send an email this time announcing it. So all right, have a great rest of your day.